The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guest or host are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced Orthomolecular Research Incorporated. Hello and welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Herkel. This show is all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. We are going to feature some very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to lead their best lives naturally. Hello again, and welcome back to Supplementing Health. I'm Dr. Paul Herkel, your host. Today, we have a really, really exciting topic. It's one that isn't going to talk about a specific nutrient or herb or intervention. We're going to dive into actually the nuts and bolts of what goes inside of your capsule. We're going to talk about purity. We're going to talk about testing. We're going to talk about possible contaminants. We're going to get to know about the quality of your supplements. So I'm joined here by Todd Frankovic. Uh, Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. So, okay. So when we talked about this, having this episode and really getting the listeners uh, behind the scenes look, I know you're involved with AOR specifically as as working on both the U.S. business side, but really I think your, uh, your claim to fame, if we can even term it that way, is your understanding of sourcing and raw materials. And that's really what we want to pick your brain. So Tell us just a little bit about how you got into the position that you're in and some of your experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've been in this uh, industry for about almost a decade now. And uh, I would say I, I got myself started in raw material manufacturing. Uh, and I've been on the side of production and sales of raw materials, uh, botanicals, uh, to be more specific. And over time, I started working my way into product development uh, for dietary supplements in the US. And over the past five, six years, I've been involved in product development and formulation for brands across North America um, with a lot, uh, mostly focusing on greens, whole foods, uh, and a lot of botanical powders and extracts. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like your experience is very much what you've kind of gone into. Is there is there even education that a person can do to kind of get into this space? You know, it it's tough uh, for education in this space because a lot of it is through experience. But I would say that uh, on the botanical side of it, you know, you you could go and have an education to become a a botanist. Um, mm -hmm. Also. Uh, going to school as a nutritionist um, or uh, an ND uh, would obviously be beneficial. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that a lot of it, as far as my concern of what goes into a capsule and the materials that we're getting and kind of weaving a path through what quality means in a supplement, a lot of that yeah. just come, it comes from experience and dealing with manufacturers and vendors um, and retailers for that matter and seeing what is actually uh, efficacious and what actually is selling in the stores and what customers want. It's a fine balance. I mean, I'm always struck, obviously, being a clinician, naturopathic doctor myself, but having experience on the industry side with AOR and other understanding other natural health products. I'm always struck by the the amount of work and the amount of detail and thought and all the things we're going to talk about today that goes into a supplement when a lot of people like my patients or cu customers ultimately often don't see that and they take that for granted. So maybe a good place for us to start is just kind of walk us through the life cycle of a product, you know, from kind of conception to 
what's sitting on somebody's counter at their homes. You know, I, I think it all begins now with what is what ingredients are coming to the market that weren't there before. You know, an example being a, a long time ago, people realized the benefits of turmeric. And mm. so people were taking turmeric as a whole food material and they were using it in cooking. And so eventually people in North America weren't using turmeric in cooking. So they ended up trying to extract it and they extracted it for curcumin. Um, I, you know, and then as time went on, different patented materials came out that improved the bioavailability of it. Um, but what really, how it really starts is, you know, going through you ch traditional Chinese medicine, uh, Ayurvedics, uh, vitamin, vitamin and mineral supplementation, mm -hmm. uh, what clinical studies are coming out now for new materials that are coming to market. Um, I, I, you know, right now, a lot of studies are showing that synthetics aren't always the best option and that there's something called an entourage effect that mm -hmm. a lot of these whole food products have that synthetics just don't come with because, you know, you don't have the extra co-nutrients and cofactors that a nutrient is supposed to be with in order to be beneficial. So now we're really looking at when we're trying to develop a product, it's not just what is this one ingredient going to do for the body, but we're looking at what is this ingredient found with in nature? And how can we take that and make a comprehensive product that is going to be beneficial for the whole body and not just specifically one function that may or may not work mm -hmm. based on what is with that ingredient and if it's if it's with other ingredients that can help it work better and be safer. Yeah, and in a lot of ways that makes a lot of intuitive sense because when you think about a lot of these botanical extracts you mentioned ayurvedic medicine and traditional chinese medicine this is these medicines this this way of healing was using botanical extracts for many years and they were using the whole plant or they're using the root of the plant and you weren't just getting a very specific substance like for example you mentioned curcumin curcumin is one of the most popular natural health products but it's a very specific fraction of turmeric and there's very little actually curcumin coming out if you just take it in, uh, you know, in curry, which is what gives it this bright yellow spice. Or even if you mix it kind of in the traditional way with milk, you're probably getting some of the polysaccharides, which are e easier to dissolve uh, instead of in fats, which is what you need to pull out curcumin and some of the other uh, curcuminoids. Uh, so that's a really, you know, that's a really great example. But a lot of the substances in products are synthetic. Uh, so, you know, how do we draw that balance with using whole foods and then also um, wanting some very specific, very pure ingredients, let's say like an amino acid or a B vitamin? Yeah, that that's actually a good point where there are ingredients like B vitamins where a lot of them, are, you know, you could get B vitamins from natural or organic sources. Yes, but they're not in a supplement. They're not in the quantities that are required to supplement your diet. And an example being B12, where it B12 uh, can degrade in many different ways. And in order to get a natural B12, it's even though you can see natural sources of B12 on the market, usually the dosages are incredibly low and not uh, a, yeah, yeah ex exactly. Not a studied amount. So mm -hmm. in order to get the correct uh, clinical amounts of B12, you have to use a synthetic. So it, it's a matter of, there are ingredients where you have to use synthetics in order to get the clinical amount, but then there are other materials like curcumin from turmeric where there are synthetic curcumins but 
you know what? Those synthetic curcumins haven't gotten the safety studies that natural uh, mm -hmm. natural curcumin extracts have. So because of that, that you know, we 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 can tell that the natural form is better, and it's widely understood that the natural form of curcumin and curcuminoids are better. But at the same time, there are things like the B vitamins and uh, even P, uh, you know, PEA and other ingredients where you just can't get the cl uh, the clinical doses without using synthetics. So it, it, there is a balance there of supplementing the two together in order to get the correct products. But I, I guess that's where the, the product formulation comes in of what's the best source of this nutrient or vitamin or mineral at any given time. And that's why products mm -hmm. are forever evolving. Yeah, it's never static. That's definitely one thing we can both attest to is that when you're formulating products and we're both involved with that, is that you're always looking to improve a formulation, even though it may be a, a class leading or an industry leading formulation, a bestseller. You know, I can just think of an experience we had with AOR recently where we just switched the sources of our B vitamins, for example. Uh, to, you know, a, a form that is more eco-friendly. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because AOR's B Complex was one of the best sellers internationally, and we've continued to evolve it a number of times in the last couple of years. Yeah, so one of the focuses that we have is trying to make a smaller environmental impact. And in doing that, we need to... We need to evaluate our manufacturers and what they're doing and what kind of practices they have in place. And so one of the ingredients that recently was having a huge environmental impact was B12. And so the process of using, uh, the process of creating B12 is very intensive and creates a lot of pollution. Um, and our, a lot of the manufacturers are based out of China. And for the longest time, they didn't have a lot of environmental regulations to stop these factories from creating a large amount of pollution while creating B12. And so while that was happening, we found a manufacturer in Europe that has a, a sustainability certificate. And with that, they have a different way of producing their methylcobalamin. Uh, which they have coined the term green green chemistry. And with that, it's creating a lower environmental impact. And it's, it's, it's really supporting the manufacturers that are going the extra mile and not just worrying about how low of a price can they sell their ingredient, but actually caring about the planet uh, and how to make an ingredient that's required, you know, for us to live better, but making it in a way that is as eco-friendly as possible. That sounds obviously really in line with what a lot of people on a political and moral you know, front are really excited about. So I think that's a really positive step in the evolution of supplements. Um, so you can look at it from an environmental sustainability perspective, which is the example you just mentioned. You also mentioned you know, bioavailability. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because that's one of the, the you know, key differentiators that a lot of supplements are now kind of hanging their hat on because, you know, as we know, there's only a limited amount of nutrients and new innovative ingredients that are coming out. And so now the innovation has gone more towards not something totally brand new, but more so how can we make some of the ingredients and substances and herbs more effective? So let's talk a little bit about bio bioavailability and then even the term bioactivity in the way that it works in the body. Yep, absolutely. So there, there are a few different ways that a lot of companies have been moving forward with increasing bioavailability. And just because we've been using uh, curcumin as the example so far, um, you know, over time we saw turmeric powders get turned into curcumin extracts. And we realized, wait a second, if curcumin is separated out from the turmeric, it's not easily absorbed anymore. Um, so because turmeric had that entourage effect when the curcumin was with all the other, uh, you know, ingredients that are inside turmeric. 
And so we, right, yeah. we, we saw a curcumin extract come to market and, you know, we, we were seeing the results and barely any of it, any of it was being absorbed. And so, you know, one of the first steps people saw was like, okay, well, if curcumin is not being absorbed, why is that? So one thing they noticed was that we were separating curcumin from everything else within turmeric. And, but there were other curcumin noids within that turmeric. So now material was being standardized to not just curcumin, but all of the curcuminoids. Mm -hmm. And that helped increase the bioavailability. Then the next step after that was like, okay, this has increased it mildly, but what other ingredients can we include with it that would increase the bioavailability? And there, there have been uh, ingredients like black pepper that have been used with curcuminoids. And that even though sometimes, you know, Black pepper could be seen. It, there are negatives and positives of black pepper, but it's very clear that it enhances absorptions of certain molecules, and curcuminoids was one of them. Mm -hmm. But once again, there's positive and negatives that come to that. So more companies came into the picture and said, what can we do with these curcuminoids to have a safe delivery system that gets it into the body with more absorption? So then... Companies started coming with, uh, you know, whether it be uh, phytosomes, uh, different Combined with fats, right? Liposomes, phytosomes. Exactly, and uh, trying to standardize it to different uh, different st uh, standardizations, uh, trying to combine it and hide it with other ingredients, trying to micronize it to make the particle size smaller to try yeah. to squeak through. Um, curcumin is fat soluble, so you know, uh, phosphatidylcholine combining it with a very specific fraction of it that was the long vita curcumin that you AOR's been used in the past and still does, right? A exactly, there, there are because curcumin is such a big ingredient, it's so easy to link it to a lot of the advances within the industry. And at this point, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more than 15 to 20 different patented types of curcumin that all increase. Uh, bioavailability. I saw one that uh, added povidone to it, uh, and so because of the povidone, you saw the big the big spikes happen uh, in in absorption. So, you know, there there are so many different ways, uh, especially with fat solubles, that mm -hmm. you you can really increase the absorption. Uh, and yeah, uh, I mean, the, it, it's a mixture of the the quality of the ingredient it's itself and then what we do with that ingredient uh because you can't make a low quality ingredient it, more bioavailable than um if you just if you come out and use a high quality extract and combine it with one of these special delivery systems uh right. that's that's where you know that special sauce comes in is where you're you're combining a quality system with a quality ingredient yeah, I th there's there's so many great points that you know we 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 need to unpack further there. Um, that's really really important to understand is that the evolution of turmeric to these really really very specific ingredients. And you know I think there's a point to make that the natural health product world has always felt a little bit inferior to the pharmaceutical world and and always influenced by it. And so I think the influence of pharma on natural health products has really, especially I would say in the last decade, has really promoted a focus uh, that is really, really microscopic. So like, how can we get that exact extract of curcumin? And then as you mentioned, something called the entourage effect, where there's other molecules in the herb or maybe even other herbs, because that's how traditionally they were used. They were often mixed up together, especially in traditional Chinese medicine, which has been around for thousands of years licorice for example was added into every single one of or most formulations because they considered it a synergizer so one particular curcumin that's recent is uh, that it comes to mind is called curcufen which i'm very intrigued by because it uses not just curcumin but also other curcuminoids and it combines it in another herb called fenugreek and there's a there's a fiber so that is a great example, I think, of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And 
And that's not just curcumin. Every ingredient, you know, I, I don't feel there are, there's a, there's animosity from time to time between the pharmaceutical industry and the nutraceutical industry. And in my opinion, they both can live in harmony because they, they both do different things. Um, with nutraceuticals, I really feel like that that's for living better. That's for taking foods and it's taking foods and finding out how can we take these foods and make our bodies run better from them as opposed to pharmaceuticals, which are about those synthetics and those isolated ingredients. But really right. nutraceuticals, I feel like is more uh, nutraceuticals as a whole. And, you know, in the, in the U S they call them supplements, right? Like they're there to supplement your life and your food. They're not, they're not there to be to replace your food. A, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that supplements, uh, and natural health products, they they're there to make us live better mm -hmm. and they can live in a world with pharmaceuticals. Yeah. I'm, I think a couple key points I just want to circle back on, because again, like what you just said was, was really, really jam packed with things that I think everyone that's listening would want to know more about. You mentioned black pepper is a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, I would agree, but I'd like to hear your take on it. Yeah, so black black pepper uh, is an ingredient that people saw increase the absorption of curcuminoids, and it increases the absorption of other nutrients. But at the same time, there seems to be the idea that black pepper can increase the absorption. It's not targeted. So black pepper can increase the absorption of things that we don't expect it to en enhance the absorption. So this includes toxins and uh, I think possibly heavy metals uh, and other ingredients that because it's not targeted towards curcuminoids or other nutrients that they're getting put in the formula with, there is a chance that when it's taken, it could increase absorption of things that can may cause a negative effect. And it's just a matter of more safety studies being done on it. Um, and there are more safety studies coming out on it that show what it doesn't increase the absorption on. And, you know, we're, we're seeing where it can and can't be used. But, that, you know, my biggest concern with it was that it's enhancing absorption, but we don't know, because it enhances the absorption of so many different molecules, we don't know what negative things that it could be enhancing. Right. And so it, it uh, to expand on your point a little bit, it inhibits a particular pathway in the liver that is meant to metabolize anything that you consume through your digestive system and including something like turmeric and curcumin. And now that turmeric is more bulky, there's a molecule added to it, made more water soluble in preparation for, to be eliminated. And the contention is, is that that if you are inhibiting this pathway that should normally be kind of metabolizing things you're consuming, well, what other things are you letting in? And so you mentioned things like um, solvents, heavy metals, pollutants, other things that, you know, your body is being exposed to on a day in, day out. So if you're taking uh, bioprene or an extract of black pepper daily, what other things are you possibly doing? And I think that is more of a theoretical concern. As you mentioned, the research is not quite there yet. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think this is a huge topic that you mentioned, the difference between synthetics and naturals. Because I know a company like AOR and other really good quality natural health product manufacturers, they use a combination of natural sourced ingredients as well as synthetic ingredients. You know, it... it a lot of people want everything from natural. And I think you kind of alluded on it, but I just want to drive home the point. Can you do everything natural? And my understanding is no, because I always tell my patients you have to have, you know, therapeutic doses. But is there a drawback to using synthetic substances? You know, I, I think there's a, it's a matter of looking at safety data and clinical research, you know, Things like vitamin C are an example where there's clinical data for grams worth of vitamin C, but there's no way that you can get a natural 
source of vitamin C that's going to be in the grams worth and still be you know, <laughs> able to be taken in a capsule at an affordable price. So I, I think it comes down to like, yeah, we can get vitamin C from Amla. We can get vitamin C from oranges, sure. Um, and, and there are other sources of it. But in order to get that therapeutic dose, you really need to have that synthetic. And so it's just a balancing act of seeing every different ingredient. How can it be? How can it be made? You know, there, there are certain ingredients like uh, vimpositin where, you know, for the most part, it was, there was a synthetic on the market. And eventually we saw that a natural version was able to come to the market and the natural version was showing uh, to have uh, better efficacy. And because of that, we, you know, a lot of the material, the, the higher quality brands with the higher quality supplements have the natural vinpositi now, as opposed yep. to the synthetic that other brands are, are trying to sell still. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's a matter of every ingredient is, is a little bit different. And it's just a matter of, is there a natural, if there's a natural source that can be harvested in a sustainable way that can produce that ingredient, then sure, let's go with the natural. Cause yeah, I would agree that in that event, the natural would be a better option, but in the event like the B12 or the vitamin C where that's not an option, mm -hmm. well, we have to rely on the, on those synthetics and that that's where, you know, science comes in and, it shows the safety data and the efficacy of those doses of the synthetic. Right. And as you mentioned, there's a degree of purity that comes in. You know, you can definitely, there's various degrees of uh, um, using, let's say, a synthetic amino acid or a, a mineral that's synthetic, like even magnesium glycinate. It's a mineral with an amino acid. Well, you can have 100% uh, pure, or they use the word chelated in the industry. Um, or you can have an 80% pure and there could be some other adulteration in it. So I really like that, that you, that you showcase the fact that, you know, really good, savvy, responsible natural health product companies are looking to try to find that balancing act between evidence-based ingredients and doses, as well as finding a natural source. But in a lot of cases, it's hard to find both of those. So then you have to make a choice. Are you going to be evidence-based or are you going to be you know food-based and those often don't intersect and that's where a lot of patients come in and i see them uh, i'm on a whole foods multi and then i start looking at you know there is you know 0 0.00 you know of a milligram of b12 in that in that capsule i'm going to tell them they're really not going to have any sort of therapeutic effect they're probably just going to not even absorb much of it so exactly. it's a fine balance, right? Yep. Yep. It, it, I think the best route is to have a combination of both synthetics and natural. Um, and even if it's a natural, natural extract, also having a balance of whole food, natural ingredients. Uh, but it's a matter of really trusting a brand uh, to formulate a product that's going to be the most efficacious product as possible. Uh, and really seeing what, what that brand stands for. Sometimes there are, there are brands that say we only use natural ingredients and that that's great. And they do the absolute best they can with natural ingredients. And then there are some that only use synthetics, but it's a matter of really researching the brand and what they stand for uh, to see, you know, are they more about low prices? Are they more about exactly. efficacy? Are they more about being natural? You know, it really depends on what brand you're going for. And that's why the brand that you shop with is right. so important. And it's, it, I think the, the 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 one step further of that is you have, the customer needs to set their expectations. Like if their expectations is to have uh, a, a therapeutic effect, then you better be taking you know a B vitamin that is in line with the research that is going to give you the forms. You mentioned methylcobalamin earlier, which is a, a more active form of B12. Or if you're getting a, a you know just a, a food a whole food based B12. Don't expect it to raise your B12 levels as quickly or maybe not at all. Maybe it's good as a maintenance. So I talk to patients all about expectations. And it's, it's also something very, um, I think, appropriate to point out is that a person's happy to take Advil every other day for their headaches, but then they, uh, and, and then nobody's asking questions about 
what's in that capsule or tablet or pill. Uh, yet when it comes to natural health products, they're like, well, where's it coming from? If it's from, you know, a, a country they don't, uh, they don't necessarily want, then they're really upset about it. But they're just, it, their, their expectations are almost uh, incongruent with where the source is from, whether it's pharma <laughs> or natural, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and as far as those synthetic ingredients, you know, not all synthetic ingredients are considered the same. Uh, there are different qualities. And going back mm -hmm. to those B vitamins, like you were saying, where we we uh, have the form methylcobalamin, which is the more bioavailable form of B12, you know, it goes the same with other B vitamins where you have B6, where, you know, I, I feel like this is a surefire way of seeing if it's a quality brand, right? Where if you look, it, there are different synthetic versions of these B vitamins. And so I think if you look at a label, you can actually tell if this brand cares, cares about quality by seeing, are they using the active forms of these B vitamins? Like, you know, for B6, paradoxal phosphate versus paradoxine HCL or B2 with uh, riboflavin 5-phosphate versus riboflavin. You know, there are different active forms that are available that are still synthetics, but they are more bioavailable and more efficacious than using the lower quality forms that you still see on the market. They're still out there, you know, and that that's really what you see. You know, that's the difference between, you know, uh, a multivitamin that might be $10 versus a multivitamin that might be $50 mm -hmm. uh, is, is all those active forms. And those active forms translate into uh, you getting more out of the, that capsule. You're getting faster improvements. Like ultimately what I've seen in my practice is that using those active forms, people feel better quicker. And especially when it comes to multiple ingredient products like a B complex or like even a multivitamin, I always, I always joke with my patients, have you ever felt better after taking a multi? And invariably the answer always is no. And the, the reason is unless you're majorly, majorly depleted, 90% of multivitamins on the market are one a day and the amount of ingredients and the form of the ingredients to keep the price down is kept as, as inexpensive uh, and, and actually not as active as possible. And so m you're not gonna really expect a therapeutic effect from something that has 20 different ingredients in it at very micro doses, much lower than you really want. So one a day multivitamins, which is what actually a lot of the research uses and always uh, rains on uh, and, and says that, you know, supplements are not effective, especially multivitamins. I would argue that the whole concept of one a day multivitamins or even sometimes two a day is is almost implausible if you understand what goes into a supplement exactly in, in one a day two a days multivitamins you you can tell what's going to be missing from that mm -hmm. and the the bulky minerals like the calciums and the magnesiums there those are taking a hit in order to reduce the capsule counts uh, so yeah it, honestly you get what you pay for right and you get well, how many capsules you're getting really dictate what's you know if there's a multivitamin that's one capsule and you see a multivitamin next to it that's five capsules you're you know you are getting less than that one capsule that's for sure <laughs> right yeah uh todd this has been so uh enlightening and i feel like we're gonna have to have you back to to chat about all the things that we haven't had a chance to get into uh, like countries of origin and purity and other types of sourcing. But uh, thank you for sharing that, especially that last point for everybody uh, that wants a little bit of a summary. How do we know what is a high quality supplement? Take a look at the forms. Uh, you know, ask some questions for the people that you're buying a supplement from. Uh, you can really tell a lot about a supplement by the types of vitamins that they're using. If they're using a cyanocobalamin B12, that typically is the cheaper less active form if they're using an adenosyl hydroxy or methyl version then you probably can tell that the supplement company is is a little forward thinking they're evidence-based and they're really using the most active forms so um thank you so much todd and we're gonna have to have you back very soon yeah absolutely thank you so much
Thank you for listening today. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcasts. Do you have a topic that you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca. We hope you tune in again next week to learn more about supplementing your health.